I would like to talk about the top 10 best carnival foods that you would recommend for people to get faster carnival results. What is number one? Suet. If you want more energy and if you want to burn more fat, eat things with stearic acid. If someone wants to lose weight, should they eat two sticks of butter every day? Maybe not. No, OMAD is probably not appropriate, especially for women, long term. Bacon is delicious, right? And I eat bacon from time to time, but if you are eating mostly bacon and chicken wings, you... I was eating 6,000 calories per day. I did a four to one fat to protein ratio, a very high fat version of the ketogenic diet. I was losing so much weight and all of my doctors, even they were like, you have an eating disorder. I started working with functional medicine doctors and they uncovered a plethora of autoimmune issues. The first one was Addison's, second one was Hashimoto's. It was just ongoing. It really, it felt like a nightmare. Um, when I finally surrendered the ketogenic diet that was no longer serving me and started carnivore. So even though I had tried it before and I felt worse and worse before, those times in the past I had done only just beef, salt, and water. Because that's what everyone on the forums, on Facebook groups, and everyone said, just do beef, salt, and water, Rebecca. It's not that hard. And I felt so much worse. When somebody is just starting out, what, let's talk about the worst first, because that's more fun. What is the worst food that they should not be eating if they want the fastest and the best results? Oh man, people are just gonna hate me if I say it. I think. Rebecca, welcome. Thank you, Rena. It's so good to be here. I have never had a carnival transformation like yours on this channel. Now you had 10 autoimmune conditions that were all cured by just eating meat. And I know that your story, it is quite interesting because you started carnival a different way. You tried high fat, you tried high protein, you tried extended fasting, but you have found the way that works for you to get the best results. So today we're gonna to talk about this best way that you guys can get results on the carnival lifestyle. And to understand that, we first have to understand Rebecca's story, because it's quite important because it kind of puts all the puzzles into the pieces so that we can find what is the best way to do carnival. So to do that, can you take us back to your earlier years, to when you were first diagnosed with your health conditions? Yeah, so it actually starts in sixth grade. My first official diagnosis, um, actually before that I was diagnosed with asthma, um, but in sixth grade, I was diagnosed with osteoporosis. So not just osteopenia, actually osteoporosis. In seventh grade, I was diagnosed with multiple severe mood disorders that I was very much struggling with, OCD, anxiety, insomnia, narcolepsy, which is actually an autoimmune disease, um, depression, and ADHD. And I was put on medications for those. So clonazepam, which is a benzopidine, Adderall and Ambien. And I took those actually for 13 years before I got off of them. Um, but, you know, they really even just barely masked my issues. They allowed me to function, but they also stole a lot of my character and personality. You know, I was running on speed during the day and taking a sleep pill at night. I was just knocking myself out. And, um, you know, looking back, it's like that was such a bad idea. Why did I think that was okay? And I was actually told by those doctors that it's not addictive. You can take it long term and it's not hard to get off of. So what's the problem? Um, but I continued to run into health issues. So in high school, I ran into very severe chronic pain. I started seeing a chiropractor. I got physical therapy in Raleigh, North Carolina. I was doing dry needle therapy. I did massage. Um, I was really trying everything. And I was in pain almost all the time. And, um, you know, something I don't share on a lot of podcasts is that during that time, I actually started stealing my dad's pain medications and taking them. I was ashamed of how much pain I was in. And my dad is also in pain. And thankfully, his pain is a lot better due to the way he eats now. But um, I had become addicted to opioids. And I had a really heavy discussion with my cousin one night who I opened up to. And he said, you have to get off of these. I don't think you realize how bad they are. And... I just remember feeling so trapped with my mood disorders and now chronic pain. And it's like, you know, where is there any solution? Um, and so I, I just kind of learned how to cope. I, I wasn't getting better. I was truly getting worse. And I got into a very serious relationship um, out of high school. I was working full time in real estate, engaged, living on my own, planning my own wedding. Um, this person in particular 
I'm glad it didn't work out. He wasn't ready to get married, but I basically did push him away also because I was so sick. I started having suffocation attacks and literally my arms would be glued to my side. My fists would be clenched. I couldn't breathe. I would be curled over in a ball and I would be taken to the emergency room. They would pump me with morphine and then tell me that it was anxiety. That happened multiple times. So much so that my dad lived with me in my apartment for a time and eventually I moved back in with my parents because I was not able to live on my own. I um, became medically un medically prohibited to work. I was un so, so unstable to the point where I, I couldn't hold my job in real estate. They were even letting me work from home for some time and I just couldn't do it. Um, and so it was at that point that you know, my engagement is broken off, my career is not going forward, all my friends are getting married or having babies, and my whole life is upside down, and I'm moving back in with my parents. And, um, and so it was at that time that I was angry with the traditional medicine care system. It was like, you guys have really screwed me over. All you ever tell me is it's anxiety. And no one digs deeper. And no one really asks questions anyways. And so I got off of all those medications, with a strict ketogenic diet. Um, this was, you know, not the first time I had done keto. So I actually grew up doing a lot of keto. I tried phases of paleo, AIP, Whole30. I worked at Whole Foods. I tried all the things. And none of those things helped me with my chronic pain or mood disorders. However, keto made us a difference. I felt a difference in my ability to focus for sure. Um, I even saw improvements in my skin. I struggled with cystic acne for about two years. And so during that time that I wanted to get off the medications, I did a four to one fat to protein ratio, a very high fat version of the ketogenic diet. And this was the first time I had ever tracked my macros um, because these, these suffocation attacks were crippling. The anxiety panic attacks were crippling. Everything I was dealing with at this point um, was very crippling. And so I started working, working with functional medicine doctors and they uncovered a plethora of autoimmune issues. The first one was Addison's, second one was Hashimoto's, uh, then I was diagnosed with chronic Lyme disease as well as SIRS, then I was diagnosed, it was just ongoing and they really didn't help me much. <laughs> they were, instead of, instead of recommending drugs, they were recommending supplements that still weren't making a difference. and. It really, it felt like a nightmare. Um, you know, my transformation photos, the first photo, I was 69 pounds. That was the very end of my journey, but my journey started back in seventh grade with those mood disorders. That is when I really started suffering and I suffered for a long time until 2019 when I finally surrendered the ketogenic diet that was no longer serving me and started carnivore. So um, the, the ketogenic diet did help. It, it allowed me to no longer be bed bound. Um, the Lyme disease, I mean, it was the point that I was bed bound and I was having non, non epileptic seizures. Um, so it was very difficult for me to drive or do anything. And the strict high fat ketogenic diet made a difference with that to the point where I could get out of bed. I could go for nature hikes. I really didn't have a social life. Um, and at this point I had multiple GoFundMes. People were, you know, trying to support me to see these functional medicine doctors do treatments. I did ozone therapy in New York City. Um, I did, I did one round of IV treatments with the Lyme doctors. And after that, after that bill and all the supplements I bought that day, I called them back and I said, I can't do this. This is not sustainable. This is literally not sustainable. I, I spoke to people in that room getting IVs who were like, yeah, I've been coming here for 20 years. We've spent millions. And I'm like, this is your life. Like I would rather die than identify with that and live like that. And that sounds horrible. Um, but I, it just didn't rub me the right way. So I said, bye. And, and, um, that is around the time that I started losing huge amounts of weight. And I was already, you know, on the fairly thin side. I was doing a ketogenic diet, but this amount of weight that I was losing was not normal. And I, again, was tracking my macros. And at one point I ate, I was eating 6,000 calories per day. I, I used a ketogenic ice cream recipe, recipe um, extremely high fat. I was eating enough protein at that time for me to not lose that much weight. And I was losing so much weight. And 
all of my doctors, including a, a ketogenic certified, um, it was it was a doctor for children with epilepsy that I saw in North Carolina. Even they were like, you have an eating disorder. And I was like, I'm using the ketogenic diet so that I can get through this Lyme disease autoimmune that you're looking at on these labs that you drew and you tell me that I have an eating disorder because I'm losing so much weight. No one would believe me. And so that went on for two years until I was diagnosed with a chronic C. diff infection. C. diff is a bad bacteria that takes over the good bacteria in your gut. And it really shouldn't be affecting people as bad as it affected me, but I had taken antibiotics like my whole life. I was always getting sick. My gut was already so vulnerable. So it definitely took over. Um, and that was a relief to see. Then people started to realize, okay, maybe it's not an eating disorder. Um, but I had already been held against my will in an eating disorder unit, UNC Chapel Hill, for an entire month. That was a horrendous experience, and that is what my book is basically starts out in the eating disorder unit and that whole experience. And what it did to my dynamics with my parents and my family, it was very awkward. You know, does she have an eating disorder or is she sick? Is she sick, but she also has an eating disorder? I mean, after that treatment in the eating disorder unit, I developed a real eating disorder. They told me things that you hear something over and over and you start to think that you're the wrong, you're the one that's wrong and that you're crazy. So they were like, if you have gluten sensitivity, it's all in your head. And um, you really need to be eating uh, five servings of sweet potatoes per day. <laughs> that's how I got my carbs. And four or five apples a day, it was crazy. And so I developed a binge eating disorder in a desperate attempt to get my life back. No one wanted to help me unless I gained weight. The eating disorder people, my family, my friends, everyone said, just gain weight, Rebecca. Why is it so hard? And it was, I couldn't gain weight to save my life. And so fast forward to May of 2019, I'm living in another state because I had to move out of my home. It was just such a toxic dynamic. Um, obviously my parents' hearts were broken, but they didn't know how to help me. And um, I met someone on eHarmony and I moved in with him sleeping in separate rooms and and just I was totally transparent on eHarmony. I was like, look, I'm really sick, probably not gonna live that much longer. Doctors say I won't live past 30 years old. I'm trying to meet someone and enjoy the last couple years of my life. I literally made that as my profile and I met someone who said, hey, I'm, I'm keto, I'm a Christian and he ended up being a narcissist and that was just like such an even worse situation. I mean, it was horrible. So um, that first night that I came over, one of his friends from his church came over and um, she was so sweet and she's still one of my friends, but you know, a couple of weeks after I had lived with him, they were like, we're really surprised that he met someone. Like he doesn't, he doesn't get into relationships. <laughs> like, um, and then people started like warning me about him. And then finally someone was like, oh, he's a narcissist. And I didn't know what a narcissist was. And so um, then I was like, crap. I really have to get out of this situation. <laughs> so one thing on top of another thing, another thing. And even that, when you have somebody in your life that is not positive or somebody that's going to help you along your journey, it just makes your chronic condition worse. It was so much worse. I, I, you know, I didn't have any support at all. I didn't even have my family. My mom had my phone blocked and I had no one um, except for my chiropractor. The chiropractor I met in Illinois who I speak about in my book, he was giving me free treatments. So I have, um, I had multiple um, uh, connective tissue diseases. So basically my rib would slip out daily. I would be in there every day for him to pop my rib back in place so I could breathe. And he was also an, an accountability buddy. You know, he knew I struggled with binge eating and, and I wasn't in contact with my family. And um, he, you know, it's amazing how God provides these people in the darkest seasons of your life. He was one of them. I also met a real life carnivore at the gym that I went to, this huge guy named Libor. And um, he was just, he was like a teddy bear to me. He was like, keep it up. I think you should try the carnivore thing. So in May of 2019, I was in my third consecutive emergency room back to back. I was in those all the time now because my electrolytes were always all over the place at, at 69 pounds. And the um, infectious disease doctor there told me we're going to have to remove your colon because of inflammation and hook you up to a feeding tube. And in that moment, I just felt more despair than I've ever felt in my life. I was desperate. Um, I was so like, I really felt hopeless. And that is what led me to surrender. 
some of the behaviors that were actually keeping me in this in this crap that I was dealing with. The ketogenic diet was an idol in my life. The ketogenic diet is great. It works for a lot of people. It worked for me for a long time, but it became an idol in my life because I was trusting in that. I was tracking my glucose and ketones and macros and trusting in all of that more than God himself. And I really felt like God was twisting my arm and pulling at my heartstrings and saying, you need to surrender this. It's hurting you. I didn't know why, but I finally did it. And I was truly addicted. I mean, I was I was doing Instacart to my hospital room getting keto ice cream. I was that addicted. <laughs> I just want people to understand, like, keto is, it is a great tool. But all of these chemical-laden keto treats are a slippery slope. And um, so that was something I had to surrender. And I didn't know what it was going to look like. But in that moment of surrender, I truly received wisdom. And I was like, carnivore makes sense. These are bioavailable foods, nutrients. You're removing the anti-nutrients. Come on, Rebecca. It makes sense. So even though I had tried it before and I felt worse and worse before, those times in the past, I had done only just beef, salt, and water. Because that's what everyone on the forums, on Facebook groups, and everyone said, just do beef, salt, and water, Rebecca. It's not that hard. And I felt so much worse. And so this time around, I was like, I'm not going to draw inside the lines. I'm not going to do what these people say. I'm just going to use my critical thinking skills. How about I just eat animal foods and cut out the rest? Let's start there. And so I had basically this conversation that we've had so far with the dietitian in the hospital, my whole history, why carnivore should work. And she convinced the chef in the kitchen at the hospital to send me up separate entrees. So they were sending me trays from the doctor with you know, the weight gain shakes and the crap food. And then the chef in the kitchen would be on the phone with me, serving me up whatever I wanted. So I got multiple entrees of hard boiled eggs, shredded pork and butter. That's what I was living on. And I gained four pounds um, in the hospital in a week. And the ulcerative colitis symptoms stopped, which was involuntary throwing up blood in my stools that stopped in the hospital. My blood sugar stabilized, no more glucagon shots, no more hypoglycemia and my electrolytes stabilized. So eventually my doctor came back into the room and said, um, we have no reason to hold you here anymore. You're, we don't know what to tell insurance. You're super stable. Go home and do your weird all meat diet. <laughs> I just wanna say a big thank you because we have grown so much in the last few months and it's all because of you. So can I just ask for a quick favor? If you love the videos that I put on this channel, if you love the guests, and their stories on this channel. Can I please ask you to hit that subscribe button so that we can share their stories to the world and help people transform their lives. Thank you so much. So that was from one week. So that's one week of doing carnival? Yes. And I just wanted to preface, so we're talking about the way that everybody watching right now can start carnival the right way and get the best results. So you said something very interesting, which was you heard about beef, salt, and water. I know many people out there, they're thinking, oh, do I have to do beef, salt, and water? Oh, that's the way to do it. I have to be strict if I want to get the results. Now you said that you didn't do beef, salt, and water. So that's the number one thing that you don't have to do. Number two said thing is that you wanted to add some variety eggs, anything that you love, the meat that you loved. Can you elaborate more on that and how that helped you? Yeah, it was simply just coming from, you know, um, so I was already trying to gain weight and I didn't want to do anything that was super restrictive. Um, and eating steak, as delicious as steak is, it was so satiating for me. So it's like, I need variety. So I allowed myself dairy and I actually allowed myself stevia for the first um, for the first little while because my number one priority was gain weight. Literally, I didn't want to be hooked up to a feeding tube. And and then after a very small period of time, I cut out the dairy and the stevia and I did cut out the eggs and I did just meat, salt and water. But this time I had found Billy Doe Meats, which is a non aged meat, it's halal, it's lamb, goat, and veal, which are low histamine. I did not touch beef for at least a year and a half. I was severely histamine intolerant and I didn't realize that was causing so many issues. I also had mast cell activation syndrome. So um, finding the low histamine non-aged meat made a big difference. But just in the beginning there to get my foot in the door, I gave myself um, definitely looser reins. And I was eating, even, I don't even eat pork and I was eating pork in the hospital. It's an animal food, right? So that was enough for me to get my foot in the door. And then from there on out, I just paid attention to how I felt like, okay, the dairy is good. It's helping me eat enough, but I've gained some weight. 
and I think it might be giving me some pain issues. So I removed it, and sure enough, I felt better. Digestion, pain levels. Um, and today, I eat lots of variety, as you may have seen. I mean, I don't just eat carnivore foods now. So everyone has to look at, you know, where am I at right now? What does my body need? How much variety can I allow? But also, is it really about perfection, or is it about what's sustainable? Because if you don't stick to it, then it doesn't even matter. Um, so I always tell people, like, if, if the bacon in the morning or the cheese or the heavy cream in your coffee is causing this much issue, but it allows you to stick to this way of eating for this much longer, then it's worth it for right now. You know, you have to give yourself time. I love that you said that because perfection is something that we all humans try to attain to, but it's something that we just can't do day to day. And especially when you are coming from having 10 or two immune conditions, all you want to do is heal. All you want to do is gain weight. I know a lot of people, they want to lose weight, but you can see that carnivore is about finding your optimal weight. It's not a magic weight loss diet. It's not a magic weight gain diet. It is feeding your body with nutrients, wherever those nutrients are coming from, from animal products to help your body restore again. And you mentioned the dairy and the stevia. So this is another thing when people start carnivore, they think I either have to have dairy or I can't have dairy. I think, or, and even with the stevia, I think the question is, does that person tolerate dairy and stevia? Does it make you consistent? If you can tolerate it and it makes you consistent, as you did with your earlier part of your journey, I think it's okay. I totally agree. That's what I recommend for my clients. I can't tell you how many people I've I've started working with and from the bat, right off the bat, I'll just say, you know, you have a history of restricting. I think that you should include more variety. There's no reason this will inhibit your healing. Um, and then they listen to a podcast or they watch someone who's a really strict, hardcore carnivore. I love them. But we have to be really careful to not get down on ourselves. They hear, you know, all plants will kill you. So they cut it out and then they end up binging on real junk food. And it's like, this is a cycle. You have to allow yourself to be imperfect. It's all about baby steps and progress over time. And then you will get to where you want to be. Absolutely. I love the fact that you said baby steps. Try to be imperfect. Don't try to be perfect. And actually pat yourself on the back to say, you know what? I had some dairy, but I'm having animal products. I didn't have the Oreo. I didn't have the chips. I didn't have the donuts. I'm having animal-based foods, even though it's not perfect. Because really, there's no such thing as perfect. It's just better choices. And you said before, you're not 100% carnivore now. What does your daily plate look like? What are you eating these days? So I am currently 25 weeks pregnant, so it looks a little different than it does when I'm not pregnant. Yeah. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Thank you. I thankfully have had literally one morning of nausea, none, none other than that. And my appetite, I still have such an appetite for meat and animal foods, but I want to eat like a little kid for some reason. So I've been making like sausages and burgers with Primal Kitchen ketchup, and it just helps me to eat enough protein. Um, so basically my, my morning is always eggs. Um, I don't go one day without eggs. I've been eating duck eggs lately. I get at least 35 to 40 grams of protein. I make, um, this sounds weird, but I've been eating turkey bacon, which is not a superfood, but it's a way to get protein. And I dip it in a homemade buffalo, whipped buffalo dip. It's made with cottage cheese, Greek yogurt, and some clean buffalo sauce. And that alone is easy 45 grams of protein. So good for me. I feel great. Um, and then I'll have meat, you know, in the afternoon. I'm still only eating two meals a day. Um, so I still eat a lot of billy dough meats, which is lamb, goat, and veal. Um, but I eat beef. I'll, sometimes I'll make carnivore pizzas. Um, I've been posting up a lot of recipes on my Instagram of just things that have been inspired. But I am not rigid with carbohydrates anymore. I I healed without carbs for three years. I healed without pretty much anything but animal foods for three years. And, and then I served strawberries at one of my retreats. And I was like, I still feel like I can't eat strawberries, but that's so not true. If all these people can tolerate them, surely I can. And that's when I started reintroducing things. So I make homemade sourdough bread these days. Um, and that is a food that I thought would always be a trigger for binging, and it's not. Um, I literally haven't made it for weeks just because I keep forgetting that I can. But, <laughs> um, And I eat, <clears throat> I'll eat fruit. You know, I'll eat organic berries with Greek yogurt. But those things are garnish. Those things always follow the animal foods. 
I do not need them. I do not miss them when I don't have them. My retreat is next week and we will only be an eating animal foods and I'm going to do great. Um, and so that to me is true food freedom where I can have some variety. You know, I can eat a mandarin orange if I want after breakfast, but I, I really don't even think about think about it if I don't have it. And so what I crave is animal foods and um, the amount of fat is just dependent on the day. Um, so that just varies. I love that you said that because I heard that you're doing quite a high amount of protein. And this is something when people first start carnival, they hear high fat carnival. They hear high protein carnival. What should you start with? Now, when you first started Carnival four years ago, what did you start with? I started with the four to one fat to protein ratio because I knew that I had a history of seizures and I knew that it was powerful. I had so many mood disorders and issues and I really needed to feel supported. So when I left that emergency room, I had a backbone again. I was like, okay, God is on my side. There is hope. I went home and dealt with the narcissist met a stranger on Airbnb who gave me a bonus room to live in, who's now my husband. And I just kept my head down and did high fat carnivore. So it was a four to one fat to protein ratio, but it wasn't low protein. Um, it was moderate protein. And then it came up into a two to one, then it became a one to one. And I did a high protein experiment. I think it was in the fall of 2019, after I heard a podcast with Sean Baker talking about his high protein experiment. And it went well. And it was like, wow, my blood sugar is not spiking from protein anymore. What's going on? And I felt great. And then after that, I just didn't, I didn't feel like tracking anymore. It was just like, I'm, I'm stable. I'm feeling good. My labs look perfect. I'm just going to intuitively eat. Um, and so I just was craving a lot of goat and veal versus the fatty lamb. And that is when I got ripped. I literally got shredded. I, I have a picture of me with abs. And I was like, what? My husband was like, you won't believe this. You have abs. And, and I was thriving. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it changes with the seasons. Um, and so the fat to protein ratio was dependent on my needs. I think for anyone who needs healing or needs therapeutic benefits of the ketones, you should definitely target higher fat than protein. How much depends on so many other things. Are you fat adapted? Do you have weight to lose? How many calories are you burning during the day? How much energy do you need to consume to keep up? Everyone varies in that way, but I think that higher fat than protein is the best way to go with this way of eating, um, especially to support our hormones and, and just longevity in general. But um, it's nice to be at the place where I don't have to track my macros anymore. I can just really in intuitively eat. That's what most commonly people do, that they should start the higher fat and then, you know, eat the butter, eat the lard, eat the animal fat, as much fat as you want so that your body can just calm down. It can just regulate, regulate it, its hormones. Because I know another thing that you say is that your hormones dictate your body composition. Yes, totally. I was just thinking that you said that. It's so true. So another reason, another reason I did the high fat when I was starting out is because ketones are muscle sparing. And I was 69 pounds, you know, it's like, I need to hold on to as much muscle as possible. And if I'm running on gluconeogenesis or my body's in a state of looking for glucose, I'm catabolizing my own muscle. Whereas if I'm running on ketones and I'm pretty good there, it's going to, it's going to spare my muscles. And that really helped me in my healthy weight gain journey to gain, you know, I never once felt uncomfortable in my skin. I gained 65 pounds and never once did I look in the mirror. And I was like, oh man, like... I wish it didn't go on in that place. I was loving my body growing. And that's not something that a lot of women can say. If somebody's watching right now, they don't want to lose weight. They, sorry, they don't want to gain weight. They want to lose weight. I think it's important to note that when you do the high fat carnivore, if you don't lose weight straight away, it's okay. If your body maintains or even puts on weight, it's okay. Why is that? It's because you need to give your body time to heal and feel safe enough to burn its own fat. And that, that period of time looks different for everyone. So if someone comes to me and says, look, I'm just looking to lose some body fat. I've been fat adapted. I've been carnivore for five years. What do I do with my macros? To that person, I would say, consider incorporating a high protein, uh, protein sparing modified fast two days a week. Um, just consider a very small deficit three days a week and then eat at maintenance a couple days a week. Keep your metabolism up. And, and you'll be great and your hormones will be good. You're not gonna downregulate your thyroid or anything like that. Um, I don't think anything under a one-to-one -one fat to protein ratio is needed to lose body fat if someone is hormonally healthy. And if they're not, if that's not working, 
then now is not the season to lose that fat. Your body wants to prioritize detoxing your liver before it is going to burn your own body fat. Your body wants to prioritize so many other things, healing your autoimmune conditions, your thyroid, your gut, before it wants to focus on burning fat. Um, and so becoming leptin sensitive is really at the root of it. Leptin is our satiety hormone. And to do that, you need fat and protein. So if you dive into carnivore looking to lose weight and you're only eating high protein and not very much fat, I'm not so sure that you'll become fat adapted or leptin sensitive and you're going to be stuck in the same cycle as you were with carbs. Um, that is a possibility. Sometimes people can just eat the meat they enjoy and it works. Sometimes people need to be more targeted with their ratios. So if you're just starting carnival, it's good to target the foods that are fatty, like ribeyes, um, steak, salmon, eggs, pork, uh, fatty chicken, the ruminant meats are best. And then if you intuitive feel that you want to have more fat, add in more fat. This is not the time, as we're talking about all the season, to say, let me just increase my protein and really lower my fat. It is the other way. Let me try to have enough protein and enough fat. And you mentioned something interesting, which was if you are hormonally balanced or regulated, how does somebody know if they're out of balance? If you're sleeping through the night, <clears throat> so you're not having wake-ups, um, not feeling wired in the middle of the night where you can't fall back asleep, if you have good energy during the day, if you, when you wake up in the morning, do you feel energized? Are you excited to get out of bed? I am. If you're not, that's actually not good. <laughs> that is a sign that you need to keep healing. It's going to be very obvious. You're going to want to be more active. You're going to want to be more productive. You will be able to hold conversations better. Like this conversation I'm having with you was not possible a couple of years ago. It's just um, basic enjoyment of life. Your quality of life will go up. And if you feel like you're struggling throughout any part of the day, I would reassess. Absolutely. And that's a time that reassess that maybe you need to be eating more fat. And this is a discussion that we're never saying lower your protein because even when you're doing the four to one fat to protein ratio, you didn't say that you lowered your protein. So let's, so we spoke about the fat, which is if you're new, go high fat, eat the fat. Let's talk about protein because a lot of people talk about protein, how much protein we need to eat. Some people say, low protein, moderate protein, high protein. There's no max to your protein. How much protein do you think we should be eating every day? Yeah, so I love this question because I was very convicted of it. In my keto days, especially with the non-epileptic seizures and stuff, I was really loving the uh, people who were, who were proponents of like 60 grams of protein per day, you know, very low protein and high fat. And like, this is enough. And that made sense to me in a way. But I was also cherry picking information because I was so desperate for those high ketones. I was chasing ketones. I didn't want my glucose to get even get into the 80s. And I was obsessing about it. And when I surrendered in that mo moment of surrender, I also surrendered my need for control. And that included all those numbers. So I stopped looking at my glucometer and I decided I'm going to eat more protein. And the science, the real science shows us that one gram of protein per pound of desired body weight is very appropriate. 0.8 grams of protein per pound of lean body mass is the lower end. That is enough to maintain your lean muscle. So that was my range, 0.8 times lean body mass up to one gram per pound of desired body weight. And so at 69 pounds, my first goal weight was 110. So I aimed for 110 per day, but I kept the VAT very, very high, as high as I could comfortably. Um, and that was huge. And I knew that my blood sugar must have been spiking but that didn't matter as much anymore because I just had to forget the numbers. And sure enough, over time, my blood sugar stabilized. It's hard to spike my blood sugar these days. And I'm eating sourdough bread and it's like flat line. I love that you said that because there's another thing, which is how to start kind of all the right way or start to get faster results. When somebody measures glucose, ketones, measure, measures their weight on the scale and measuring, 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 that can deter your results because you're just then freaking out, thinking, should I increase my protein, decrease it? Should I increase my fat or decrease it? So another big thing, as we're talking about here, is forget the measuring. The tra I mean, tracking at the beginning maybe can be good to understand how much you're eating if you're eating enough protein. You don't have to worry about the fat. That's what we say in our group. Don't worry about the fat because if you eat the fatty meats, fat's already there. But make sure you're hitting the protein number and then don't worry about anything else. Don't track glucose, don't track ketones, 
Would you think the same way? Generally, it kind of depends on the situation. So if someone comes to me who lost their period and is trying to gain weight, I will have them track their fat. Because if you're just eating more protein than fat accidentally, even ribeye steak is only one to one fat to protein in grams. So they couldn't live on ribeyes. They need something like lamb chops. It depends on the situation. Usually, I that is what I tell a lot of clients is let's just focus on your protein right now. Even before you cut out the crap. Let's just focus on getting enough protein because then it'll be a lot easier. You'll be more satiated. Love that. Protein power. We are protein girls. Okay. The, the <laughs> yes. next thing when I was listening to all of your story and it's just incredible all your, see, this is the thing. Rebecca had 10 autoimmune conditions, all cured by carnivore, all cured by just eating meat. And she tried different things like the fasting. You were saying that you did extended fasting and we hear about extended fasting. Oh, do a 36 hour fast, do a 24 hour fast, you know, OMADs, all these different things. Did you, did that help you at all with your results? With my, so with my healing, I stopped all fasting. I mean, I was doing intermittent fasting, um, but no more extended fasts. And I will say that it helped during the fast. You know, I felt the higher ketones. I felt the autophagy definitely felt less pain in my body in general felt less of the effects of the autoimmune issues I was dealing with. But did it help me in the long run? No, it set me back because when it came time to break that fast, my digestion just felt even worse off. Um, I did not feel like it helped my gut. Not saying that it doesn't heal the gut. I know that it does. But in the state I was in, it wasn't the most responsible thing to do. I, I generally don't recommend fasting until someone is actually feeling stable. I don't think it's the best tool for healing. Um, in some situations, like if someone's fighting cancer, I think some extended fasts could be really powerful. But I also think that people are over fasting and we're never like, you need to nourish yourself before you fast. And um, that's something that a lot of people don't hear. There's no one thing that you have to overdo. Like you don't have to be strict carnivore, over fast, over exercise, overdo anything. It's all a natural part of life. Like our ancestors would do, they'd eat, have maybe some berries or fruit like now and then they would run, they would hike, they would jump, they would, you know, kill something, but it's all in, mo it's all, I hate that word, moderation. I'm not going to say the moderation <laughs> word, but it's all, because nothing is in moderation. It's all, how do you say, natural. It's a yeah, natural part balance. of life. And I think it it's balance. And I think it depends on who you speak to. You're going to go in that zone. Like I was, I think like you, I just thought, let's just do high fat and just bump up the fat and really lower the protein. I felt kind of good at the start, but then I just felt like terrible. I was just like, I was doing like 60 grams of protein. So when you said 60 grams, I was like, oh, I did the same thing. And I felt like, geez, I really, like now I'm having like 130 to 140 grams of protein a day. And you know what? It's just because it makes me feel good. It makes me feel great energy. I know that I'm feeding my body amino acids and all everything that I need, especially being 40 plus. We lose 1% muscle every single year after the age of 40. You need the protein. It's not, it's not going to increase your blood glucose. And even if it does initially, it's not a bad thing. It's not as bad as we're hearing out there. Now, the other thing that I wanted to cover, I have a few more things to cover, which is things that didn't work for you in your journey that we hear a lot about. Um, you mentioned with your mood disorders that coffee wasn't something that was great for you. I know people are going to listen to this and think, well, bloody hell, <laughs> oh, coffee. Now, do you have coffee now? Um, well, I'm pregnant, so I'm not having any caffeine. But before I got pregnant, I did get to the point where um, I was, I would enjoy coffee maybe once every 10 days. It's not something, I mean, back before I even un uncovered my issues, I was drinking so much coffee every morning. I loved my coffee. You know, that was my bowel movement before Adderall. <laughs> and, um, and now... Now it's like, eh, it sounds good. You know, I love the smell of it when my husband makes it, but then I'll make it for myself and I can't even finish it. Um, so I, I do tolerate it now, um, but I definitely don't depend on it. And I have great energy without it. It's just for enjoyment, you know. Um, but when I first reintroduced it, it was after, I think I want to say it was around a year and a half after I had been carnivore and consistent. And all of my labs did look good before I reintroduced coffee. However... It gave me anxiety and I was drinking purity coffee, which is the brand I'm now affiliated with. So it's clean, mold free. And I definitely had anxiety like almost immediately. And I don't know if it's just because I, I really hadn't had caffeine for a long time, but I didn't touch it again for a long time. And, um, 
but now I do tolerate caffeine. I just don't overdo it. I don't need it. I think caffeine is one of those things that if you need it, then you probably shouldn't be using it. I love that. It's again, you see this conversation is all about balance. It's not yeah. about no, and it's not about yes. It is about, is it right for you? So if you're studying carnival and you're thinking, okay, I'm having the coffee, I'm having some heart palpitations. I'm not feeling that great. I don't sleep that well. So maybe you might want to think, okay, I'm going to have a break from coffee maybe seven days, 14 days, it's not that bad, and then reintroduce it and then see if it works for you. It's not something that, oh, it's a plant I can't have. Like, I, um, I'm not going to say I can't stand, but it's really annoying like when you hear that, that, that you can't have coffee because it's very restrictive and it actually puts people off from doing carnival, puts yep. people off from wanting to make further changes because they're holding on to things. Even I am yep. still holding on to it. I love my coffee. <laughs> so... It, like I do, like I really try to, like I want to give it up. Even like Dr. Bright says to me, well, you know, it does cause you sometimes to have anxiety. It's a pretty good reason to give it up. I was like, well, true, but you know what? I do like it and I'm pretty much carnival otherwise. So oh, I'm going to keep it. So that's coffee. Have it, don't have it. The other thing was people always ask about, and I wanted to hear your, your thoughts is calories. You mentioned that you were trying to hit 6,000 calories. If people are just starting, want to get the faster results, do you think that they should increase their calories, decrease their calories, or even think about calories? I don't think you should think about calories. I think you should think about macros that are appropriate for your body. So how much protein will support your body? That's number one. And then do you need a higher fat than protein ratio? And once you get that right, that ratio right, you're going to end up with the right amount of calories or energy intake for your body's needs. And so I don't talk about calories. Um... When I was doing 6,000 calories back then, I did think about calories. I didn't think of it the way that I think of it now. And I was not eating at that surplus when I gained my weight. What I did was remove the anti-nutrients so I could absorb nutrients. So it's about the food that you absorb. It's about the quality, way more than the calories. Now, do calories matter? Yes. If someone wants to lose weight, should they eat two sticks of butter every day? Maybe not. <laughs> But, Probably not. But you should send the proper signal to your body that it has plenty of this dietary fat. This is an inefficient fuel source. Maybe you could burn some of your own body fat. And to send that signal, you do need to eat enough fat. So again, it's case dependent. But I definitely think um, sending the signal to your body that it has plenty is so key. And a lot of people are afraid to do that because they don't want to gain the initial weight. Um, most of my clients don't gain weight. They raise their resting metabolic rate. You know, my women clients are mostly eating 2,200, 2,500 calories a day, and they've lost weight. Some people do need to gain it before they lose it, but you will lose it due to leptin. You'll, you'll find an appropriate body weight. It's so interesting that when you just eat protein and fat, you actually, even though we don't need to count calories or even think about calories, but when you actually see how many calories you're eating, you're actually eating as you said, 2,000, 2,200, 2,500, try eating that on a high carb diet. So when people say that, you know, all macros are the same, I want to say as if, like, come on, because if I or you or somebody else was to eat the same calories with carbohydrates, what do you think is going to happen? You would end up with mood disorders, digestive issues, energy crashes. First thing that comes to mind is what is your blood sugar doing? The food that you put in your body, what does your blood sugar do? If it's doing this, you're not going to feel good. And you're you're going to be storing fat. You're going to be having more cravings every time your blood sugar comes down because of insulin. It's just not, it's not a good plan. You're not supporting your hormones. Calorie in, calorie out doesn't last for people because they're white knuckling through it. And that's not food freedom. We were created with so much more ability to just regulate our weight if we would just give it the right foundation. And that's why people try to do carnival because they think, well, you know what, I can just eat without, I guess, the limitation or the restriction. And that's the other thing. Don't restrict when you first start. Don't restrict. Eat as much as you need. There's so many people, and I'm sure you've seen with your clients, they're going to say, should I eat like six ounces of meat? Because that's what I've been told. Because, you know, like my husband eats like 12 ounces. So I, I should just eat half because I'm right. a woman. No. <laughs> Eat as much as your husband yes. or eat more. If you're a woman, if you're a guy, eat as much as you need. If Eat as much as you need to feel satiated. The other thing is um, I hear a lot, eat until you're like really, really, really full. Do you think that's good? 
I don't believe in eating until your Thanksgiving full. That's not how, that's not a part of God's design. I think that's close to gluttony. What I say is if you're trying to gain weight, eat until you're full and then take one more bite. That's what I did. And if you're at a healthy weight and you're stable, I would say maybe stop when you're at an eight out of 10 out of the fullness scale. I think you should leave a little bit of room there because if you're eating until you're stuffed, you're literally demanding all of your blood flow to go to your digestion. You're gonna feel tired. It's a big energy demand on your body. You actually slow down a lot of healing processes if you're stuffing yourself all the time. So, um, you know, you have another meal coming. If you can balance your macros where you get enough throughout the day in a, in a normal way that's comfortable with your digestion and everything like that, I really think that's optimal. Absolutely. And when we talk about this, and I know that some people watching, they're going to be thinking, well, I do an OMAD and I like doing an OMAD and it works for me. If one meal a day works for you, do it. That's great. Is it optimal, especially for women? Questionable. I gained half of my weight on OMAD, actually. Um, I, really? I, yeah, at 104 pounds, I got my period back and then COVID happened. So the gym shut down and my appetite decreased because I wasn't weight, 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 weight training anymore. And so I did OMAD and I gained, kept gaining. Um, so you will absorb what you eat. And I think it has to do with me coming from a binge eating background. I'm comfortable eating a lot in one sitting. I was eating enough and and when I went to OMAD, I made sure I was hitting my macros still, um, but it didn't do anything. I mean, my period stayed normal. I continued to feel better and better. And so I think it really depends on the person. For women, you have to ask yourself, is my thyroid supported? Do I have good energy? And there were days where I felt like, eh, I need another meal or I need to break this up today. And that was no problem. I basically did it out of convenience and I didn't have any issues, but I spent 15 years doing keto and extended fasting. So I think my body was a bit more prepared to do that. Um, but I think as a general statement, if we're making blanket statements, no, OMAD is probably not appropriate, especially for women long-term. Absolutely. So when you hear people doing one meal a day, doesn't mean that you have to do one meal a day. Eat as many meals as you need to feel full and happy. Now, the last thing I wanted to cover which people love foods. I love hearing about foods around the best and the worst carnival foods that we should be eating. When somebody is just starting out, what, let's talk about the worst first, because that's more fun. What is the worst foods that people should be eating, that they should not be eating if they want the fastest and the best results? True carnivore foods? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I would say probably oh man people are just gonna hate me if i say it i think okay let me just preface this by saying it's important to talk about what doesn't work because people are doing things and they're not losing weight for example i hear so many people i'm having pork rinds i'm having for example a mcdonald's burger and i'm adding i don't know xyz on top and i'm like well okay yes it's technically carnival but is it going to get you the best results so this is an example of like okay that, that makes so me feel better spell it, spell <laughs> yeah. it out spell it okay. out spill so i think us. bacon bacon is delicious right and i eat bacon from time to time but if you are eating mostly bacon and chicken wings you so that's polyunsaturated fat primarily and your body really wants to burn saturated fat just as a simplified way to explain it polyunsaturated fat is actually recycled into our lymphatic system and deposited into our fat cells to be burnt. So you will burn it eventually, but if you want to just oxidize fat easily, um, kind of like MCT oil, right? It's immediately used. Saturated fat is pretty close to that when you're fat, adap fat adapted. Saturated fat from ruminant an animals also is loaded with things like steric acid, with conjugated linoleic acid, CLA. These are fat burning supplements that are literally sold on the market. You could just get it in your ruminant animal meat, your fatty lamb, your fatty ribeye, and you'll burn a lot more fat probably compared to eating, you know, fatty chicken and pork all day. So I'm not against people eating pork from time to time for variety, or if you have bacon with your eggs in the morning, that's fine. But are you eating enough of the saturated fat during the day? Because that omega three to six ratio matters and it does change the way that you gain or lose weight. Those, that would be my first one only because it's the thing I see people stump people and uh, stump people with weight loss, you know, clients who come to me, especially men, um, it's the bacon, it might be the coffee, it's the fatty chicken wings, you know, incorporate more steric acid and it's incredible what it will do for your metabolism. So is there any other foods that you see that people eat that don't get them the results? 
because you've I got the experience the so we want to hear it <laughs> i think the pork rinds is a big one and then also the fatty lattes um you know it's oh, they're yes. so delicious but it's like this does this is energy like um you still get an insulin response from fat it just doesn't happen until 24 hours after you've consumed it and people think fat just doesn't do anything and it's like no it your body still has to burn that and so if you're giving yourself 500 calories of fat that's 500 calories of your own body fat that you're not burning that morning because you drank it in you know five minutes so I think they're great in the right context, but for someone who is at a weight loss plateau and they're using a ton of heavy cream, butter in their coffee, MCT oil, um, I think you'd be better off leaving it out and, and just focusing on eating the fatty meat. Um, I also don't think it really supports leptin when you're drinking your energy. I think it's much more efficient if you're eating it with the protein, along with the protein. Um, so that's another thing that kind of irks me because I see a lot of people struggling to lose weight and they're like, I don't get it. I'm, I'm eating a stick of butter every day. I'm drinking my fatty latte. I don't see the problem. <laughs> it's like, well, you mentioned something else, a stick of butter. <sighs> what do you think about a stick of butter? Poor Elizabeth Bright. <laughs> I think she got really well, beat up for that. This is a thing. So I actually, I'm in Italy, so I am down the road from Dr. Bright. So I'm going to see her. <gasps> yeah. I saw her last weekend. Oh, and she I'm so invited jealous. Me for lunch. She's so lovely. And I'm going to her house for lunch uh, next weekend. And I said, listen, like the, the, the stick of butter thing. She said, you know what? That's, that followed me around like a sore thumb. I heard her say that on, on an interview with you. I heard her say it. And, and I feel it because it is a good recommendation for some people in the right context. It's a great recommendation. But, you know, people hear that and they latch on and they're like, butter's delicious. This must be the key. And so, yeah, that's something that a lot of people, I think it was a trend. And it was a hurtful trend for a lot of people. I also think that feasting and fasting is a hurtful trend for a lot of people. You shouldn't be getting into that if you're brand new to carnivore and you're not even fat adapted. Like that could be really too much for you. Or if you have hypothyroidism, let's focus on healing your thyroid before you jump into fasting. Um, you know, there are just things that we love to hear this information. We love to be involved and hear what's working for people, but you have to sit down and consider what are my bio-individual needs? Is this really honoring my body? Is this really serving me? Or am I just trying to get results like this? And um, so, yeah, the stick of butter thing is kind of iffy for sure. Okay, let's go into, I would like to talk about the top 10 best carnival foods that you would recommend for people to get faster carnival results. What is number one? Suet. Suet. Suet is, yeah, it's a fat found around the kidneys and it is the second richest source of stearic acid in the world. The first richest source is cacao butter. So that's not an animal fat, so you're not gonna get the best bang for your buck. Suet is loaded with stearic acid, it's a saturated fat. And that is, you know, there's a supplement called, I think it's like fire in a bottle. It's literally just suet, it's just stearic acid. So that is um, great for someone to become fat adapted, to be burning more fat. Steric acid supports mitochondrial fusion. So it's basically taking two damaged mitochondria, fusing them together to create a new healthy cell. And that's where our ATP is produced. So if you want more energy and if you wanna burn more fat, eat things with steric acid. Number two is lamb. I think lamb is amazing. It has even a better amino acid profile in my opinion compared to beef. Beef is fantastic, but lamb is low histamine. It contains high amounts of phenylalanine, which is a precursor to dopamine. So if you have mood disorders or histamine intolerance, eat some fatty lamb. It's delicious. Um, gosh, top 10, <laughs> I think. Okay, from suet, lamb, let's suet, put lamb. beef in there because it's pretty good. Yes, beef for sure. And it's one of the easiest ruminant animals. You know, it's very accessible, I think, for a lot of people. Um, butter mm -hmm. should be in there, I think, for sure. Butters in the right quantities in the right. Exactly. So not limitless butter, but butter is great. Contains butyrate, which is great for your gut. It is a fat that's more enjoyable to eat compared to suet. Um, and then I want to just say seafood in general, it could be oysters, shrimp, um, sardines. I think oysters are probably should be in there. They're just so mineral dense Salmon. and we Salmon. need our minerals. Um, Eggs. Eggs, there you go. Eggs are total superfood, and that includes duck eggs, quail eggs, any type of egg that you enjoy is awesome. Um, and then I also wanna say like elk or bison. Um, 
they're just overlooked and they're incredibly delicious and it's a really great quality protein and it's great for someone who enjoys beef but you want more variety um and then i was going to say something else but i forgot um that's okay that's 10 if, if <laughs> okay, you have good. a bonus go for it <laughs> probably organs organs should be included okay <laughs> Okay, well, I might try to include organs or maybe not. Or All maybe right, not. well, no pressure. <laughs> well, I just want to say a big thank you because I know that you were a bit pressed for time, but we have made it and you have provided not just your story and your transformation, but how people can start carnivore the right way and get the best results because we hear so many different things, so many confusing, like confusing amounts of information. So thank you for making it very clear. How can people find more of you? I want to say thank you to you. You did a great job at leading this conversation and I love watching your interviews. So it's an honor to be here truly. Um, people can find me on Instagram at tailored keto health. And my name's not Taylor, it's Rebecca. And you can also find me at my website, which is tailoredketo.health. And those are probably the easiest ways. I'm on Instagram more than anything else, but I'm on YouTube, Facebook, under the same handle. I'm going to link everything down in the show notes so you can follow her and see all of her amazing content. But thank you so much. I'm sure we're going to see you very soon. Thank you, Rena. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Rebecca about how to start carnivore. Now, if you're new, you need to watch this video next with Dr. Ken Berry. It is the ultimate beginner guide to start carnivore. I'll see you guys next week.